All right, so Sid's muted, but you know what? We are here. We are here because our buddy Sid. There we go, Sid. Joe, I'm I'm just <laughs> I, I, I am so frazzled and so honored to be here tonight. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're with 10, 21, 20. 2020, here it is. We have Joe Hour, my good friend, and one of this nation's most Prolific sports writers, certainly in the Olympic sports, well-regarded Miss Bonnie Ford. Welcome, Bonnie. Hey, Sid. And and Joe, as you know, this week um, marks a, a tragedy in, in aquatic sports that, that on Friday it'll be 10 full years since we lost Fran Crippen. Wow. It, wow. Seems, it seems so fast. And uh, I mean, that Rome seems like yesterday to me, actually. So it's a... It's, uh, Sad news. And, and we'll get to some of that. And I kind of want to start a little bit tonight acknowledging not just the tragedy. We're going to build in. We have family members and teammates and coaches. And, but, you know, Bonnie Ford brings a, a great presence to our show. And, and as a professional in, in the media world and, and certainly as somebody who was instrumental in getting the story of the death of Fran out there and and – and to this day, you know, her presence has moved a lot of people. And uh, so we're going to kind of begin a little bit tonight where Bonnie tells us a little bit about her perspective and, and how she came upon the story and, and what she knows of Fran Crippen. And, and then we'll kind of move back into his life and get his early years and, and go from there. So, so, Bonnie, I do very much appreciate your time. And, and you know, we got to know each other when I was uh, just finished with Fina, I had retired for, for the first time. I haven't retired the second time yet. But I, I was the chairman of the Technical Open Water Swim Committee and, and watched Fran get his medal in Rome and then retired. And, and my friend Steve Munatonis took over. And, and uh, so in 2010, I was no longer officially in the Fina world of open water. I had said, OK, I'm just going to take a step back. And then during that time in October, the tragedy occurred, and, and when uh, USA Swimming looked to put someone on a committee with Toby Smith, and, and, and we looked into the investigation, that's when I first spoke to you. And I remember that distinctly, and, and then our, our relationship through the years has continued as you've continued to not just follow this story, but be there for many stories. So. Give us a little bit of your perspective from, from a reporter's point of view and also your personal perspective, if you don't mind. Sure, and it's really a privilege to be here. Uh, Fran's story moved me and influenced me more than almost any other that I've covered in my career covering international sports. And I have to start out by uh, saying and, and humbling myself here by saying that I never met Fran in person. Uh, I covered swimming like most reporters who cover swimming. I covered the pool and I didn't know a whole heck of a lot about open water. I knew that it had become an Olympic sport in 2008 and, and that was about it. But I knew the Crippen family. Um, my husband and I have a home in Philadelphia. My husband, Bob, was a columnist for the Inquirer for many years. And so everyone who covers swimming knows uh, about the Crippens. And I remember that moment at the uh, Sydney trials where Fran, uh, when Maddie qualified for the team, Fran somehow got onto the pool deck and, and was at the end of her lane to congratulate her. Uh, so like everyone, I guess, um, I remember where I was when I heard the news. And of course I was stricken for the family and his friends, but my my first reaction was a professional one, which was, wait a second, you know, elite swimmers don't drown, and they don't drown on a race course with people around them. And how could this have happened? Something is very wrong here. And because I had obviously proximity to the Philadelphia area, um, I the very next day went to Germantown Academy, spoke with Dick, uh, Maddie, who was very bravely serving as the family spokesperson during those early days, agreed to sit with me. Um, and I just went about finding out as much as I could, both about Fran and about the sport. 
And several days after his death, I was able to track down some of the other swimmers who had been in the race, including Alex, uh, who helped me immeasurably understand the events of that day. And I wrote a piece. And the reaction to that piece was overwhelming. I was astounded at the way people spoke about this guy universally and about the way people reacted to the story. And so that only compelled me more to understand what had happened, try to hold those who should be held accountable for it, and uh, simply to so explore the bigger question of, um, in an event like this, which has inherent risks, who bears responsibility? And how do we mitigate those risks as much as possible? Because as we all know, sitting here, when you put that Olympic carrot out in front of talented athletes, they are going to chase it and somebody has to take care of them while they're chasing it. No doubt about it. Can't hear you. You know, you're, Sid? Joe, uh, I'm so sorry, yes. Joe. No, you're Joe, good. You, you were doing blogging at the time. And and um, I remember well because, you know, we were already following each other. And uh, so, so what were your thoughts when, when you got the story? You know, uh, so, so Katie Gordon was his lane mate at Virginia and she, she speaks so highly of, of Fran. And let me just read you a couple of things and then, and then we can move on. But I had the privilege of training with Fran in the UVA distance group for four years and watching him grow into a tremendous leader and competitor. His mental toughness was in work ethic was unparalleled and inspirational. I can conjure images of Fran alone in the UVA pool deck long after everyone else left for morning practice, either on the Vasa trainer or pounding a medicine ball. But this tremendous commitment didn't prevent Fran from being a lighthearted goofball, which I've seen interviews and he, and he is, but um, his big bright smile and friendly demeanor was infectious and he could put a smile and even the grouchiest face at an early morning practice. Needless to say, everyone who swam with Fran adored him. So, you know, I, I coached Katie, Katie Gordon her whole life. And, um, you know, if she's saying that about him, that's really something because she worked her tail off too. And, and um, I didn't know him, but I knew a lot about him. And, um, you know, just, you know, it's sad, but, um, you well, know, if his legacy and, 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 and demeanor and, and life can, can carry on, I think it's awesome. Yeah. And, and we're going to explore that a little bit. And Bonnie, we're going to come back to some of those, you know, he, he was such an incredible competitor. And, and I know that, um, you know, the, the, the competition that I remember shortly before he, he passed. I mean, the, we were pounding the world of open water swimmer. We had great swimmers like Alex Meyer, who we're going to hear from shortly. Andrew Gemmel, you know, an Olympian in, in the pool and one of our greatest open waters. Um, th those kind of guys were racing with Fran. And in, in 2010, there's one of our national team coaches, Tim Murphy. You know, he always took the time to come and say hello. That's that's what people say about Fran and his ability. You know, I remember, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about how, you know, in 2008, he, he was just on the outside. But he won the Pan Ams in 2007 or nine. And then all of a sudden we Long Beach 2010. We've got that footage. Bess is going to play it for us. Let's, let's just watch. Fran ends up winning. Then he jumps out. Take a good look at. Just watch this. We got about a minute of video for you all to see. Put go ahead, Bess, when you're ready. Start at any time. Man, that's awesome. Now, that guy he was coming out to hug is a guy we're going to bring in here briefly to say a few words. Where, where's Coach Schulberg? Can we can we bring him in? There he is. There he is. All right, Coach, do you remember that moment in Long Beach uh, when Fran jumped out and gave you that big hug? Yep. Sure and, do. And, 
And and what can you tell us about Fran Cripp and the boy who grew up in your program? Uh, I lost a lot of hair. Um, <laughs> I lost a lot of hours of sleep because he tested me every day. But I loved him for it. Well, I, I'll tell you what, who else really loved you and 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 Joe, we're gonna let's let's bring the let's bring the Cripping girls in here for a minute. And um, you know, the, the idea being <laughs> I had him in. Okay, Bess, you got it. So we have Teresa on the left and Maddie on the right. You girls, thanks for being here tonight. We, thanks when for you know Coach Schulberg's talking about th that um uh, you know, Fran was, was quite the character. Now, you guys had different stages in relationships. Tell us a little bit about the Crippen family, order, the hierarchy, where Fran fell, and that type of thing first. Give us a little feedback when you first met, you first got into swimming, and then, of course, met Coach Schulberg. Uh, sure, I'll take the lead. And somebody said that Fran, like, always put a smile on her face or in, like, early morning practice, and... He never put a smile on our face, so I'm <laughs> glad he put a smile on everybody else's face. Um, uh, I'm the oldest. There's four Crippens. Teresa's the youngest. Fran was, is second, and then we have another sister, Claire, who's third. And there's about four years between all of us, um, four years between me and Fran, four years between Fran and Claire, and then one year, Teresa was born after Claire. Oh, you can paint your own picture. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so we, because of the like time difference between all of us, we all had like a very like unique and different childhood, I think. Um, but we all like grew up just like brothers and sisters grew up. We like loved each other, didn't love each other some days, <laughs> thought, thought. Um, but it was great. And uh, we lived in a, we grew up in a small town in Con called Conchahokan, right outside of Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Um, where my parents still live and it just so happened that it was 20 minutes from where Schulberg had started um, a swim program at Germantown Academy 30, 40 years before I was 30 years before I was born. <laughs> so it was right in our backyard and um, we all loved to swim. And so my mom was like, go, I found a place to swim. So go swim at Germantown Academy and um, the rest is history. So uh, what about you, Teresa? When you, you actually had uh, Fran as a big brother, what was he like for you? Um, I feel like big or little for Maddie, he like just wanted to torment us all of the time and was like very good at pushing our buttons um, and knew exactly how to do it. But he was like one of those people who you'd be so mad at him one second, but then he would have you laughing like five minutes later. Um, so he like knew how to push your buttons and make you mad, but also make you his friend at the same time. Um, so I always had him to look up to. Uh, I always like wanted to chase him around the block and do what he was doing, even if it wasn't the best thing to do. <laughs> um, but, and then even with swimming and everything, just always had him and Maddie to look up to um, throughout my whole career. And, and so so you guys all growing up, swimming for Schulberg, you're doing these crazy sets. And and when was it, Maddie, that Fran first passed you in practice, or did he ever? Yes. You're going to hear noise in the background because my kids are running around. So this is really, really right. like a, a, a family environment. Good, good. That's what um, we want. So I, mean, I, I have a like super distinct memory of Fran beating me for the first time. I was 16, Fran was 12. Uh, Schulberg had this program he called Mirai. It was like, and it was Mirai, he told us meant future in Japanese. I never, I never researched it, so I don't know if it's true. But it was this, his Mirai group, so his future group. And it was all these young, like 11, 12, 13 year old kids. And then in the springtime, when high school was over, the the future group got to swim with the um, high school kids and we were doing a set of um, eight 200 IMs. I still remember it. And I was like, we were swimming eight across and GA's pool for those that have been there. So there's like lots of splashing and hitting of arms and legs. And um, 
And I look over and I see he beat me on like number five. And I was like, how does this kid, how is he beating me? Like he's totally cheating. Um, and then like number six, he beat me again. And I yelled at the wall, like stop pulling on the lane line. And then number seven, he beat me. And number eight, he really beat me. And I remember a coach saying like, Maddie, he wasn't pulling on the lane line. Like he really beat you. And I just had this like instinct that that was it. Yeah, I'm never going to beat him again. And so it wasn't even worth getting mad anymore. I just was like, fell over and let him. Well, well you may remember, I grew up as a Mill Atlantic guy and Coach Schulberg actually sent me this uh, T-shirt back here. It says top of the day, GA. Um, and and that, that was for helping you out, Maddie. There was a meet at GCIT. They weren't going to let you in and you needed to swim the 800 free or something. And, all the, and I got that in the mail. I was so proud of it. The Crippen family is royalty in Philadelphia swimming, right? Bonnie, you grow up there. You've known that. We, we've got this situation, Coach, where we are trying to get open water into the Olympics. Maddie is Villanova, Philadelphia, you know, Germantown Academy, Olympian, and he, on front of the bulletin or the end, whatever it was in those days. And, and so she was a star. Coach, you remember I called you up and I said, we're trying to get open water into the Olympics. I've got to have an Olympic swimmer in this new 10K race because in Atlantic City, we'd always have the around the island 37K race. Well, this one was only a 10K. I convinced Maddie it's a sprint. Now, I think it was a full year after your Olympic experience. You remember that, Maddie? Sadly said I do. But don't be sad about it because look at it this way, girl. Without you, we wouldn't have Olympics. We wouldn't you have say Olympics. that. I think you're just trying to be nice to me. Uh, no. Honestly, I showed up there. You promised me that we could, I could go out to like a bar and restaurant in Atlantic City when it's all over. <laughs> I, I showed up and I was like, oh, I'll just like start with the main pack. Well, the main pack was all men. I had no idea. Halfway through, I was like in the bay. I, I did. I was like, where? How can I stop? Can I get out? I tried to swim over to like a public dock. That was out. that was a FINA World Cup event in the USA. It was called 10K for the USA. And remember, was that the year Sarah McLarty came to, or did she come the next year? I don't she know. Was, you remember everyone that? Went, everyone went in front of me. So I was like, <laughs> I don't know who was there. I just know that I never I I think I needed to go to like a restaurant at the end and have like a good like seafood dinner. But oh yeah. Well, we at least provided that. But yeah. I, I swear to God, we helped promote the race because when I went back to FINA and said, look, we got Olympians, we got people there. And and every year the 10K took on a little bit more. Um Bonnie, do you you remember much of that takeover in Fran? Dick, maybe. Um, I'm going to ask Bonnie first, when, when you're thinking about looking back on the story and your, your concept, Bonnie, of the 10K race as an Olympic event, you said, yeah, I was just following swimming. What, what is it about that race that's different, that really separates, it might attract a guy like a Fran Crippen? Oh, gosh. Well, um, you know, Fran was obviously a, a great distance swimmer number one, um, and an endurance athlete. And that race has, I mean, it, it, it's a very physical race, especially um, initially, but through, you know, a two hour race approximately, there can be quite a bit of jostling and quite a bit of jockeying for position. Alex can speak to that much more than me, but it's not like you have your nice, neat little lane and the two lane lines and the fastest wins. You know, there's there's a lot of tactics to it, um, a lot of strategy, a lot of, you know, whose line do you trust, um, along with just being out in the elements, which is incredibly challenging. And, you know, every day is different. So uh, I think, you know, from what I understand, there was a lot that appealed to uh, Fran about that race. And... Dick, what wanted, was it? What was it for you then? Tell oh, me. Oh, for me. Well, no, I'm no, fascinated I mean, with distance athletes in general. I mean, I've covered marathoning and um, triathlon, and anybody who can, you know, stick to uh, the training for those events, which is so lengthy and tedious, and I don't know how y'all do it. Um, but then to, to try to be the best on a given day when, as I just said, the variables can just be, you know, there's so much stuff that's out of your control and to be able to manage that mentally, 
um, I just admire it. And so, and I'm a water baby. I love, I was a swimmer, a very, very slow one. Um, but I, I loved, have always loved covering swimming. And, uh, you know, sadly, <laughs> I really didn't know much about the event until Fran died. Um, you know, I, I kind of discovered all the nuances and, and challenge of it through his story. But since then, as you know, uh, you can't keep me away. I've, I've covered those um, races in, in London and Rio. And um, I, I find it to be an incredibly we'll compelling in sport. We, we, still, we hope to have that Tokyo race. But hey, Coach Schulberg. Yep. I would like you, when Fran came to you, as I recall, there was 2008 Olympic trials, but before that, maybe 2007, he was still pretty young trying to, when, when he got into open water, what's your recollection? Because I, I remember that well, you he, had some pretty good ones. He won the gold medal in 07 in Rio at the Pan American Games. And the nice thing, that was the first event in swimming and then Teresa won the 200 back, the last event. So I call that a bookend meet, where we had two gold medals, the first and the last event. Um, I knew Fran was going to gravitate to open water. Um, I thought it was suited him the best. And he loved the challenge. And I always liked open water when it was really open water in the ocean. Uh, I don't like these lake swims where it's like a glorified pool. But for mental <laughs> toughness, for mental toughness, I think Fran thrived on the ocean water and ocean races, and that was in in Rome. And, and that was in the Pan Am Games. And he didn't care about the course. The rougher, the better, because he was so freaking mentally tough. And um, I remember him telling me, what, leading up to 2010, I don't train on Sunday. Sunday's my day off. So after morning practice at uh, uh, another pool that we would train at, I go back to GA just to check the damn filter. I don't know why I did it, but I did it. And Fran would have the Vasa trainer, the Erg, a spin bike, and he'd go 90 <laughs> minutes. And I would say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just having a light day. And I'm like, light day? Are you freaking kidding me? And, and that was Fran Crippen. He trained every day. Uh, one day I gave Maddie Crippen off because their cycles were off. And I said to Maddie, Go home and relax. The next day, her cycles were worse. I said, Maddie, what the hell did you do yesterday? Oh, I ran a half marathon in Conshohocken. Well, Conshohocken has a whole bunch of hills, and it was only like 114 <laughs> degrees out. But that was Maddie Crippen and Teresa and the whole family. And her dad said to me when Maddie was in ninth grade, I want you to hold my kids feet to the fire every day. Don't give him a break. So I never gave him a break. Except Teresa, because you know, she had the best smile. Thank you. <laughs> well, well, that's that's honest. At least you can do that. And Maddie knows the truth. She's shaking her head. She remembers well. I'll tell you what I'd like to do. Um, talking about toughness, there, there's a guy in the, who's pretty tough himself, and, and he credits a lot of it to your brother, Maddie and Teresa. And um, so, Bonnie, I'm going to I'm going to put you back in the green room just for a minute. And, and we're going to we're going we're gonna to bring in uh, one of the national champions here, Alex Meyer, who um, welcome, Alex. Good to see you, man. What's going on? This is a pretty good good company to be in. Thanks for, for having me. <laughs> well, we're, we're honored to have you. And, uh, you know, you've you've done so much for the legacy of Fran. Certainly in those early years, all of us remember you carrying his picture to the podium and and carrying on for for many, many years of open water and echoing a lot of his sentiments uh, about clean water and healthy you know events and those types of things. Tell us about your introduction to Fran Crippen and, and how you got to know him and maybe a good Fran story. 
Um, well, my f- actually, <clears throat> I often forget this, but my first real introduction to Fran was actually my uh, junior year of high school on my recruiting trip to the University of Virginia. And uh, I actually think this says a lot about Fran, where at least when I was in college, re- recruits on trips would sleep on a couch or like a spare bed or a cot or something like that. We didn't really give, they didn't really sleep in like the beds of people on the team, but Fran um, had like a, a top bunk uh, and he shared a room with, with one of his, uh, his teammates and he let me sleep in his bed. So that was the, the first time I ever met Fra- Fran was pretty much like, Hey man, how's it going? Uh, yeah, you're staying here tonight. Um, and my bed's right there and you can go ahead and uh, make yourself a home. <laughs> so that was, that was pretty much who Fran, who, who Fran was uh, really off the bat. But when I, when I really met Fran was when I, made my first national team, which was in 2009 um, and qualified. So I actually did my, my first 10 K ever in 2009. And I got fourth at nationals, which qualified me. Actually, I remember I walked out of the, the water and they're like, Hey, congrats, man. You made the national team. You're going to Rome. And I'm like, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for that. I'll go to Rome and swim a 10 K. That sounds like a great time. They're like, Oh no, you're actually swimming the 25 K the 10 K is kind of reserved for like, <laughs> second so you you can do the 25 so uh i ended up doing that and you know i was still very very new to the sport so relied very heavily on fran for a lot of kind of that like tribal knowledge if, if you want to call it that just kind of you know some of the tactics and strategies and how the game is a little bit different on the international stage versus the national stage and um he off the bat like just really um you know really just friendly guy, easy to talk to. We ended up being roommates for pretty much every trip we were on, but um, especially that first year just like really took me under his wing and, you know, gave me tons of pointers and um, helped kind of boost my, you know, my confidence um, quite a bit. And um, I, I I attribute a a lot of my success to to having Fran, Fran as as such a great mentor, uh, you know, especially uh, during those few years, like the the tail end of my career. Well, he, here's what I remember about Rome. And I remember you being the, I remember, because because I was on the USA Swimming Committee too, and I was chairman of the FINA. And they and they had a selection process for you when you got a chance to go in the 25K. We were so thrilled. Hey, the young guy, that guy, yeah, he's tough. He's out, he's going to go. But what I remember about the 10K race, because Andrew Gemmel and Fran were our 10K entrants, that year and of course this is one year after our first olympic games and and fran had just missed that team and really wanted to have a shot to go to the olympics and he was determined to make london you know not just make the team but get the gold medal and he had this whole plan he would tell you about but coach you know it because you helped him create it but the the reality that i had was i was getting ready to step down from my role. I had been in in FINA. I had come on in 96 as a member. And and by this time now I was a chairman and we had achieved our goal. We got into the Olympic games. We had 2008 and and the way politics were working, I'll say, okay, it was time for me to step down. And and my friend, Steve Munitonis was going to take over right after London. I mean, right after Rome, 2009. And, uh, so I, I knew it was my swan song. And as you guys started the 25K, I went off and got a plane and said, okay, good. I got to get home to the Junior Olympic meet. My last official duty, my last official duty, Dick, was going in front of the FINA, you know, the, the, the entire FINA Bureau and, and explaining my, how I interpreted the rules because you'll remember – and Alex, you remember, and 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 we'll have Steve on here in a moment to tell us. But Fran ran down into a buoy, and I thought he was going to win the damn thing. I mean, he he and Andrew Gemmel, and was it Thomas Lurs, right, the great Lurs, the three of them, and and uh, and a couple of the Italians. But they had pulled away, and 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 anyway, I think we've got a we've got some video from. Uh, the internet, Sumi World, I think, the, who provided one of these interviews with Fran about the 2009 World Championships in Rome. So let's play that, best. Let's watch that for a couple minutes here, and then we'll come back with this with this group. Welcome back to the show. It's time to bring on open water star Fran Crippen. He's on Skype right now from his home in Philadelphia. Fran, welcome back to the show. 
Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me back. So your race in Rome has become quite the talker, especially because of that finish. Describe what happened. Um, well, I was um, approaching the finish, and I was about three, 400 meters away, and um, I took an inside line, and uh, I was headed directly towards the finish shoot, which is marked by two yellow buoys. And uh, I didn't want to sight. I didn't want to look up because it just slows you down. And I, I saw Thomas Lurs, uh, the German who had won the 5K. He was off to my right. So if I just bre uh, kept breathing to my right, I would be able to see him. And I figured I'd just use him as a guide to get into the, the finish shoot area, which is uh, 50 meters from the, uh, the touch pad. So I'm swimming along, and uh, I was feeling real good. And I knew I had a great shot to win. And all of a sudden, I just went head first into this buoy. And um, I came to a complete stop. And my momentum carried me under. And I popped up. And um, it shoots in this way. And I was on the left side of the lane line. So I said a couple of curse words. And I dove under the lane line. And um, I was probably now in about fourth or fifth place, and I sprinted in, and I probably made my last 50 meters even faster than it would be because I had such an adrenaline rush, and I was just on such a high. Uh, and I was able to sprint past uh, a couple guys, one of the Italian swimmers, and uh, grab the bronze medal. And um, it, I mean, there was a big protest, but I didn't break any rules. I mean, I just hurt myself because I'm an idiot, but... Um, it worked out fine, and um, uh, the FINA board ruled in my favor, which um, we were very happy and very relieved about. And um, so it was, a, it was a great experience. I mean, I had a great race, and I was just really just happy with how I raced. And even if, um, even if they would have, the protest would have been upheld and I would have been disqualified, I would have been extremely disappointed, but I also would have you know, taking solace in the fact that I raced really well and I raced better than I ever have in my life. And I was really just happy about that. You see, what, what, what really happened there, I was front row seat, Coach Schulberg, and you, I know you were there. And, and the yellow buoys were the different color, Alex. You remember, all the other buoys were orange. And in the meeting, I stood up there as chairman and said, you, the, the yellow buoys are just for direction. In the middle of the course, we had some other yellow buoys. Yellow, it doesn't matter what side you go on. Well, these yellow buoys happen to be attached by lane lines all the way to the finish. So Fran, was, when, he, when he got bonked in the head, and I mean, he lost three to five seconds. He's swimming for five meters outside the lane line, then he ducked under. And that's when everybody was going crazy and, and it, it was in Italy and it happened that an Italian got fourth and all of a sudden they bump him up to third. It says DQ. You, Coach Schulberg, what do you remember? Because I remember you coming over to me in Rome that day. He's still on the mute. Okay. Alex, you, you we'll see if we can get him off. Go ahead, Coach. Um, I went to you and I said, Sid, what rule did Fran break? And you said none. And I said, well, then how did he get DQ'd? Well, the Italian got fourth. Now he got third. So I said, where's the meet referee? And you pointed out the guy, and I went over and had a little discussion with him. And then I went back to Jack Roach and his wife, and they wrote a, a protest in favor of Fran. And thank God Mark Schubert went to bat for Fran and Jack Well, Roach you know who it was? Coach, you really spoke up in the bureau because I went into the meeting. Shelly Taylor Smith is our secretary, went into the meeting. And uh, Tomas Haches from, from Cuba, who was the referee. Yep. Um, Shelly and I had one view we gave to the bureau as the chairman and the secretary that, no, we said yellow doesn't matter. And, and Tomas said, had said, no, he said uh, he had changed his mind, but he said, no, I think he should be disqualified. And then they, we all left, and we don't know what happened, but our representative was Dale Newberger, of course, longtime yep. Bureau member. And, uh, and, and I know that Dale, and, and I talked to a couple of our other colleagues in there, and you know who else did a lot uh, behind the scenes was Dennis Miller um, as a yes. member of, of the technical committee. It was moving on to the to, – he was not on the Bureau yet. But the idea that, 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 that we had said publicly, and, and I just love the idea that – Alex, you were talking about, you know, that 
that he was so tough. And and you watch that interview, girls. I want to ask you two girls this. I, I know you've seen that interview before, and here it is, 10 years. My God, I know it's so sad. What what a guy like that would have given us over the last decade, you know, here on earth. And I've got to believe that as as we all of the same faith believe that he's given us, he's continuing to give us all this spirit, all this all this momentum, and we've got to keep going. We'll never forget. But what what do you think of Maddie or Teresa when you when you see that video from Fran in two thousand nine? Uh, mine's kind of inappropriate. Uh, I totally agree, and I appreciate these kinds of things to like bring us joy and make us remember them because it to- it really does, and it does for me too. So I want to say thank you before I get into this, <laughs> but. He he used to sit there all the time, it's like when he came back and was living at my parents' house. And he got he got this T-shirt that said <laughs> that said, "If you think I'm a B, you haven't met my sister, right? Isn't that what it says?" <laughs> and so he like was he sent us this video message before all any of us like t- sent video messages, and he was like, "Hey t- hey like." Maddie, I got this for Claire's birthday, but I really should have gotten it for your birthday. And it was like, my sister's a B, but you haven't met. I forget what it is. But he gave it to Maddie for her birthday, but it was about me. So he like <laughs> sent the video to me. And he like did all of his videos from that chair in my parents. So one and they were my, usually inappropriate videos. Yeah. And one, I'm like, it's a good thing mom and dad let you move back in for so long and just like mooch off of them for so long. <laughs> um, or else you would have done nothing. Um, so it's kind of like he was the spoiled the prodigal son come home. Every hey, you yes. couldn't do no wrong, and here the three girls, you two and Claire, had to just bust your butts all the time. Yeah, truth. Yeah, it's like so, had it easy. Oh, okay. A- Alex, tell tell me what you recall, either that or a good good story of it that would kind of. Stand up for the men because these girls are saying that Fran really was, you know, maybe we shouldn't hold him in such high regard. He was. Well, a- <laughs> I'll just say, uh, I'll start by saying that was, I remember watching that race actually from the hotel room because I had to compete, I think maybe the next day, because if you recall that championships had the schedule very condensed because of the, um, the storm that basically destroyed the, the venue um, on like, I think what was the, supposed to be the first day of competition so they had to postpone some things and really get everything done before the pool competition started but um that i'll just say that fran has left uh a a huge legacy that uh you know no uh, that that um means a lot to a lot of people um but one thing that not that many people know is that we have a rule in place that says that you actually have to go through the whole entire finish shoot from starting at the buoys that mark the end of the lane lines or whatever. So we kind of call that the Fran Crippen rule now. And it's uh, just kind of a funny little thing to remember him by, but I'll, I'll just, re- I'll relate a story from the the following summer, actually in 2010. So we were at uh, Pan Pax and it was in August and it was in Irvine. And I think there was a, it wasn't just me. There was a, like a um, like salmonella or something going around. There was like I don't know if it was food poisoning or it was some kind of sickness, and I ended up getting really really sick uh, like a day before the 10k. And that year, even though we had already had a World Championships uh, about a month before, um, that was our Operation Gold event, which meant that's where you qualify for all your funding. So that was in terms of like your status on the national team and making, you know, your stipend and everything, that was the big race. But so that's why I felt like I needed to at least go give it a shot and, and, you know, see what I can do, even though I felt terrible. Um, About halfway through the race, um, I'm like getting dropped by the pack. I'm just like getting, getting my butt kicked completely. And I feel terrible. I'm like contemplating getting out. And the pack is like 50 meters ahead of me. And then I'm like kind of looking up and like seeing how far I am behind. I look up and I see someone swim in the opposite direction. I'm like, what the hell? And like, am I going crazy? Am I like, lo- am I like so out of it that I just like, I don't even know what direction I'm going the wrong way or something. Turns out it ended up, it was Fran who actually swam, who was in the pack, swam back to just check on me and like make sure I was okay. And that is like such a, 
you don't even really need to know that much about s- swimming or sport in general to know that that is an extremely rare thing to happen. And like people, people don't do that. You know, you're, you're out there racing for, for medals and for money and for the ability to like have funding for the next year. So you can continue to do this in the first place. Um, and the fact that he would just turn around to come check on his teammate, um, so it just says a lot about, uh, who, who Fran was. Yeah. I, you, you know, I see coach Tim Murphy, the, the Penn state coach, certainly one of our national team coaches for many, many of those international trips. And, and he remembers that. Well, I, I do think coach Schulberg, um, I'm going to, going to move you out just for a minute and bring in the guy who followed me, Steve Munatoni's. If he's uh, if he's still ready to come on, and Steve, uh, of course, is the, welcome, Steve, the guy who provided us with uh, you know so much inspiration and 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 that footage from the Franz race with you, Alex, in in Long Beach, you and Chip and and uh, Andrew uh, came from Steve, and and the, what you do with Wowza, Steve, is great, and so you you came in at a time and i think this is something too we'll probably get back with bonnie but you and alex were very adamant about how we are going to move forward so when i moved down uh and out from fina technical committee and you took over where did you see this place in the story because when when you took over for me it was only months later i guess or maybe a year later when the tragedy occurred What's your perspective? Oh, I got a lot of perspective. But uh, one thing that, you know, falling in line with what everybody's saying, um, I had sat with, I would think, for hours with Fran. Fran was an unbelievable athlete. He could have been a linebacker. He could have been a water polo player. He could have been a team handball player. And he just brought a lot of grit and toughness that, that, will trans, transcend any sport. But he wanted to know the subtleties of the sport because, I mean, he was racing against the great Thomas Lures, uh, you know, the greats, and they were tough. Um, and the Europeans were over in Europe, you know, literally slugging, pulling, elbowing their way, you know, in their European championships. And Fran and, you know, Alex and... Uh, you know, uh, Andrew Gamel and everybody, if you look at that race that you showed earlier, it was what I would describe as a very, uh, a race amongst gentlemen. Everybody had their lane. There was no pushing or, or bumping or anything. And Fran knew that. Fran understood when he was with what I would call the big boys of Europe, he had to pull out that that grit. But he also had to know the subtleties of drafting and positioning and et cetera, et cetera. And he went, and that's what many great athletes do. But then Fran went above and beyond that that I, I've never seen. And how did he go above and beyond that? He went above and beyond that because he was very interested as a relative newcomer to the sport to make the sport big. He wanted to understand, like Steve, if we're, you know, elbowing each other at one part of the race and then we're suddenly trying to draft another part of the race, like people need to know what's happening around the pool buoys and and turn buoys. And and so I was sharing with him over many hours what, you know, what was involved in the sport. And one of the areas where he was just like adamant was safety. And, you know, he was just like, well, how many, you know, feet away should the boat be? And, you know, what about the propellers on the boat? And, you know, what happens if I run into a feeding uh, a feeding stick? And, I mean, he got into minutia that there was no athlete up until that time had ever asked me about. And he was always doing it because, A, he wanted a gold medal, obviously, but B, he wanted the whole sport to rise and to elevate to a level that he thought the sport justified. And I think that was just says everything about Fran as an individual, because as with, with Alex, he gave up his bed for Alex and, and he really would give up, you know, his, it, if it, I swear if, because I remember when he, he did a U-turn in the race to go back to, 
to Alex, and I'm thinking, now what is this guy going to do? I literally thought he was like going to take off his goggles and hand them to Alex. That's the kind of guy that he was going to do. Now, at the same time, he gave he would have given his goggles to Alex. He also would have made sure that Alex wouldn't beat him. And we, that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing Maddie with her hand on her face, going, "Wait, this isn't the Saint Fran show. Let's tell the real story here, because I know she's." Go ahead, Maddie. I mean, he would have done that. He did do that. He was very nice. He was a very nice man. But he, he would have kicked you in the end, too, if you were like, yes. Oh. So there was like the juxtaposition of like behaviors. But yeah, I mean, I totally agree. And as his sister, I had like felt all those things, right? Like one moment he was very nice to me. The next moment he was like throwing spears at my face. So <laughs> it's the decal and hide of open water swimmers. So, so Alex, he took you in as his younger brother. Did you ever feel like maybe he was doing that? So, okay, I've always got control of this guy because he'll look at me as the big guy and I'm the man and he's my little buddy. What, what do you say? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so because I, I think he was confident enough in his own ability to, to where it, it just – if you teach somebody a skill or something like you obviously know it a hundred times better than they do. So like, what difference does it make if you just like gave Fran, them? Gave Fran, them yeah. And I, Fran also wore his emotions on his sleeve. He couldn't hide them like from the time he was five years old. And so like he cried going to kindergarten because he missed my mom. So <laughs> I like, if he didn't, but love you and like respect you, then he wouldn't have done those things that he did for Alex. So it had nothing to do with like him, like him being cunning because he was not like that. And so not smart enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Teresa now at, at the university of Florida and, 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 and once um, the, you know, my, my son Quinn was telling me this story today. And, and of course, Artie who swam with you guys, Arthur at, at, at Germantown, was really involved in, in, in one, you know, and Alex, you can appreciate this, or Steve, being distance athletes, but that they would do the 100 100s, and, and, Al, and, and Arthur was pushing it because he was Fran's teammate who he looked up to Fran, right? What was the difference in age between those guys? It was pretty big, but Fran trained with him after Fran came back from Mission Viejo and trained with GA. Um, that's when he swam with Arthur. So Arthur was young when Fran was there. He was like a freshman, sophomore, junior. Right. Um, and, and he looked up to him like a big brother, like an assistant coach almost for Schulberg, right? Yeah, exactly. All the, there was like a bunch of guys um, in that high school group um, that all, Fran kind of took them all under their wing and they were just crazy high school boys, but Fran would like help them find their way. Well, you know better than most the legacy of distance swimming at the University of Florida. And Quinn was never in that group, but he would talk about the day they would do this. And Arthur would announce, this is for Fran, we're doing this. And they would do it right around the, the anniversary of, of his passing. And, and Quinn said it became, you know, he graduated high school in, in uh, 2013. So 13, 14, 15, those years in, in, in Gainesville. Mm -hmm. he, he said it was a hallowed event and, and the other groups would stand around and in, in, in the kind of the balcony and watch. And he said it would, because Arthur would refuse at a hundred to stop. He would go until failure until he couldn't make a, a, another hundred on a minute. And he would get up into 123, 137, whatever it was. And Troy would just let him go. And he, until he completely failed, but he said the emotion of that was was incredible. And Alex, you had a chance to do training camps. Do you remember anything really special about that grit that Steve was talking about? That these everybody's been talking about his ability to just really get up and get after it. What what's a good training memory you have of Fran? Did, did you have any of those? Let's get you off the mute because uh, yeah. What I remember, um, so most of the camps we did together were not really heavy volume, like crazy 31,000s or whatever, stuff like that, because we were, it wasn't really training camp, it was more like preparing to race camp, so we were definitely like in our taper mode, but I remember one point we were at a World Cup in uh, Hong Kong, and there was a very, um, very talented um, open water swimmer named Yasu um, from Japan, 
and he's a pretty quirky guy. I've actually kept in touch with him over the years. Talked to him a few weeks ago, actually. He's a wild man. But uh, anyway, he, um, everyone knew who Fran was, right? Like, every, like everyone kind of wanted a piece of Fran. And that's just kind of the way it is in the sport. Like you're like Thomas Thorpe has a target on his back any race he goes to because, you know, he's Thomas. So Fran was, was kind of the same way. And I remember we were doing a practice at this pool, a beautiful pool actually in Hong Kong outside. And Yasu was like in the lane, the lane over, like racing Fran. We, we were doing like a hard set. And Yasu would kind of jump in like every other hundred or something like that and would be racing Fran, like touching him out. And actually Yasu is, can swim like 100 or 200 like very fast. So he's got some real speed. This uh, naturally pissed Fran off. So Fran said something. He's like, basically like, you want to do the workout with us? Come over here, get in here, get in this lane and do the whole thing from beginning to end. We're starting to set over. Let's go. Get get, get here. You're going there. I'm here on the top. Let's go. And and actually it was, I was behind one of them. I don't remember. I wasn't because we only had two lanes. But I remember it actually being a very, a, a tight workout because after that set, he like turns over to me under his breath. He's like, God, that guy's fast at 50. <laughs> <laughs> we were, it, but it was, it just, uh, I think it's a testament to Fran's just like competitive nature where he was like, Oh, you want to race me? All right, let's get over here and like do this the proper way. Well, I, I, I saw Bonnie's comment that uh, she interviewed Arthur and, and here's, here's where I want to go with this while I have you and Steve on Alex. Girls, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you out just for a minute, but I want you to think of one thing you want to come back with to say. And um, let's bring Bonnie back in. Um, and, and while I have Bonnie and Steven and Alex, the, the, the aftermath of the tragedy and, and where we went, Steven, you were now in, in the FINA Technical Committee and, of course, you know, doing what you could you know, as that guy on the inside. And, and Alex, I know you're carrying around the photo and, and Bonnie, you're writing the story. That was 10 years ago. What's the perspective? Because we're, we're not going to, we're, we're getting near the end of the show and, and not that we can't go over. We usually go an hour, but we're not going to hold it to that tonight. But I want to get an idea from each of you in kind of your sign off statements tonight before we bring coach Schulberg and the girls back. What you think the, the, the effect of that moment was and, and where it was going, we talked about how Fran really was about safety and he was forethinking and all that. But um, I'll start with you, Bonnie, because, you know, you have such a great perspective and, and, and you know, where, in, where we are, where we're going, what, what are you thinking these days? So – I'm going to hijack a little bit because one thing I want to say before I get to that is that I have the perspective of covering many, many professional sports, mainstream sports, every Olympic sport you can think of. And it's very, very tough for a professional athlete to get to where Fran was in his career and literally have no enemies. Like I did not speak to a single person who didn't speak of him with absolute admiration and reverence. And I know his sisters can tell stories on him and so on and so on. But all of the stuff that we're saying, we're not just saying it because he's not here anymore. We are saying it because it is true. And as an example, the reach the guy had both in the United States and all over the world was incredible. I got a note today from Brian Reichman, uh, who's a Belgian swimmer who was in the, the race uh, the day that, that Fran died unsolicited, he saw, I guess, Sid, that you were doing this show, and he wrote me a note and said, um, I saw you're doing a Fran Crippen story. That's amazing. Fran was a big inspiration to me and had a big impact on my swimming career and still in my life. It's great his memory will last in ways like this. Even after 10 years, I still think about him often, and I hope swimmers from this generation will hear all about his story and his life. Um, uh, I'm a father now of a beautiful daughter. Fran and I are the same age. I was talking to my wife last week that 10 years has passed. We wondered how his life would have been. I think it's important for all of us and for the sport that we learn from this. I'm coaching now and all my kids ages eight to 20 know about this story. So 
this is a guy, I mean, Alex, I'm sure you remember Brian a little bit, you know, he competed with Fran, knew him a little bit, saw him on trips and yet he left this giant mark. Um, so to answer your question directly, Sid, I think what Fran, um, I think Fran's legacy in the sport is awareness. Um, you know, you can never eliminate risk completely from an event like a 10 K. Um, there's variables, uh, of weather, there's variables of, uh, athlete, you know, things can happen. Um, but having eyes on swimmers and making sure the conditions are fit in that order, I would say, are the two most important things. Um, that Fran's death, going back to that first question that I had when I heard the news, is like, wait, elite swimmers don't die. Well, yes, they can die if the conditions are unsafe and if no one is watching to see when something happens. So um, what I'm really, really also admiring of, uh, Fran is not the only member of his family that had endurance. The family started a foundation and uh, a lot of times, you know, people are well-meaning. They start these things after a loved one passes and then kind of, you know, momentum kind of fades and it goes away. Well, the Fran Crippen Elevation Foundation is still going, still advocating for safety, uh, still awarding scholarships to athletes who the family um, and the other uh, people active in the foundation deem, uh, you know, sort of channel Fran spirit. And so, uh, you know, to the extent that it is possible, I think, Fran's memory has been kept alive in both a very practical way as well as an emotional way. And um, I, before I sign off, I just wanna say that everyone who has been on this show helped me tell his story. I couldn't have done it without you. And um, you are the ones who lost, you know, someone very dear to you. And I'm always will be indebted to you for, uh, you know, helping me tell this incredibly important story that in terms of issues of athlete safety and welfare, that's a story that will never, ever, ever pass from, um, you know, a high level of importance for, for me as a journalist. So thank you. Amen, Bonnie. Very well said. And as, as we best put up there, the Fran Crippen, uh, dot com, I believe it, it, it it's it, dot net, Fran Crippen dot net. You see their swimming world. The foundation, anybody who watches this live or the replay, it's a great way to give back and, and to help us promote, you know, the, the loves of Fran's life. Okay, Stephen, you are up next. Uh, give us some insight. Okay, so before Fran died, people, when they thought about risk in open water swimming, they primarily thought about sharks and cold water primarily hypothermia and sharks. Well, sharks rarely, you know, come in races and, and hypothermia is, is, a, is an issue. But when Fran passed away, he literally opened up the awareness that you could, there was risk both when the water is warm and when there's cold. And when he did that, when, when the circumstances of his passing meant that suddenly the thing that was very dear to Fran's heart, which was, you know, how do I do things? Uh, how do I win by subtlety, but also by strategy? And when I told you he was actually uh, wanted to know everything about the sport, being too warm was also an issue. Being too cold, having Venom. He, we think about sharks, but it's really jellyfish. And so what his legacy is, when he talked about safety, suddenly safety was much, much bigger than what everybody had thought previously. Previously, it was cold water and sharks. Now, when we address risk, it spans all temperatures. It spans all marine life. It spans coaches in a, in a, or, or officials in boats. And because of that, everything in the sport has been elevated. How you referee, how you train, how you coach, how you race, how you conduct yourself on the feeding dock uh, by the buoys. So, I mean, his, his impact on the sport was so profound and so pervasive 
I don't think it will ever be equaled. I, I really appreciate that, Steve, and I appreciate your time and perspective. And, and certainly as one who, who was, you know, front and center and what you still do to help us promote that safety and promote the legacy of, of Fran Crippen, um, I want to thank you and, and thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. Um, Alex, it's your turn to uh, give us your closing comments. And I really, really do appreciate you being with us uh, as one of Fran's um, closest competitors and, and uh, one of the guys who, who also knew him best, I think, from a lot of different angles. So uh, leave us with some gems, Alex. <laughs> um, I mean, I feel like we could we could go on for days telling Fran stories and, and talking about what a great guy he was and what a pain in the ass he was sometimes and what a hard trainer he was and some of the dumb stuff he did in races and some of his incredible moments, but ultimately he was, um, he was just a very real human, um, uh, and, uh, just, um, uh, you know, a great friend and teammate, uh, to me. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's very ironic that he was a little bit ahead of his time in terms of really caring about safety. I mean, I, I know personally, it wasn't really anything that crossed my mind on, on a, um, even when I raced, let alone on a daily basis. And I think that, um, you know, my mind has, uh, really changed on, on that since, you know, since the tragedy happened and have tried to carry that, that torch, um, at least similarly to how he would, um, over those years. And, and I, I'm glad to say that I think there has been some progress made, but there's, there's definitely, um, more ground to be gained in that fight. And I think that, you know, safe, safety in general is a matter of, you know, there's there's a kind of a multifaceted approach to it. I think that, um, you know, there's rules and regulations that need to be changed. I think that we're getting there on that front. Um, always room for improvement. Um, there's, uh, you know, the technology pay, plays a role. I, I work with a company called Wave Drowning Detection Systems that we're, we're working on some uh, a tech solve for this problem. And also the just education in general in terms of like the risk, you know, the warning signs and, and the, the risks. Um, associated with with swimming um and the, the the foundation does some great work with that stuff so i think as long as we uh keep plugging away and, and all those um areas then we'll see progress um over time and a lot of that will be uh i, I frankly thanks to fran so amen alex and you know what i i did uh, watch your interview last week with steve Munitonis and Ned Dennison of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame, and you you um, brought to light this new technology. And I, anybody, I would encourage if you're interested, just Google Alex and W O W S A Wowza. It's it's really cool stuff, and I have looked into it, um, and I, I think it's something that our community could could really benefit from. So thanks for all that and all that forward thinking. Um, Coach Schulberg, you're almost in the picture. You know, if you could either scoot a little bit to – there you go. Now we got you, Dick. You know what, Coach? I love you so much. You were such a hard ass on us in 1973 when we went to Germany as the head manager and, and ultimately the head of the whole trip, as we learned. And, and our relationship since 1973, and that was around the year you had uh, maybe Jamie Hemley and Tom Bryan as your first national guys – we have grown to be colleagues and, and um, through this whole um, crip and tragedy and legacy and, and ultimately joyous, uh, I, I believe, reunion somewhere, someplace, according to our faith, uh, I, I am just so thankful for all of your efforts and your undying efforts to make sure that the safety that Fran talked about is, is still first and foremost in everyone's mind. So we're, we're going to close off here with you and, and the girls. And, and I'd like you to leave us with anything you'd like, Coach. It's your turn. I'm so fortunate to have all the Crippens. And I miss them every day. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, Teresa, you look great. <laughs> Teresa's well, she is the youngest. <laughs> Teresa's going to be a mom. And Maddie, how many kids do you have now? 
Three. Three. I know. It's highly unskilled labor, Alex. <laughs> Teresa, what's this is how I'm finding out you're pregnant? <laughs> what the hell, man? On the monkey. <laughs> Should learn to mute his mic a little sooner. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Love you all. Love you. Uh, Love you. Well, thank you, Coach. Okay, girls. Um, I don't know how I can like over that. That was a, a great end. Um, I I think I want to thank Bonnie for bringing up the foundation. I think that um, I, I'll end with that. I feel like that has given our family over the last 10 years, the ability to keep Fran's memory and legacy alive and um, being able to support those athletes um, through the foundation over the last 10 years and them letting us into their lives has, has been really rewarding. So um, our goal is to keep it going and to do it as long as we can and um, stay involved in the sport of swimming for as long as we can, because it gave us so much and, um, Fran cared about it and loved it and we want to help it grow. So thank you. Thank you, Maddie. T? Um, yeah, I just want to thank everybody for like their support over the years. Um, it is definitely hard every day um, and not and having everybody supportive um, has definitely helped our family get through this and continue to get through this. Um, and Fran loved swimming and I think my mom at his funeral, there was so many people of all different ages. And I remember one of the things she said was like, what did he do when he wasn't at our house? He, he impacted so many people's lives. And unfortunately with his passing, it allowed us to all see that. Um, but it is also like Maddie said, kind of fueled our motivation for the foundation and just trying to help as many people as possible. Um, so we're going to be broadening the mission of the foundation a little bit to be able to reach out to the different age groups because Fran loved helping really young kids learn how to swim and um, also like helping older kids as well. So um, we're looking forward to that in the next chapter of the foundation as well. Well, I really appreciate that. And we all want to continue to support the foundation and I want to close out this very special edition of Stories with Sid by first, for all of you that are on the call as, as guests, please stay on just for a few moments when we sign off because we'll, we'll, we'll still have our closed goodbyes. But for me, I, I think of Fran every week on Sunday when I'm in mass. I mean, it's, you know, when they get to that part about that and, and uh, those that have departed and, and, um, there's, a, there's, there's people in your life that you think of. And, and so at least once a week, I've got your brother on my mind. And, I, and I, I am so thankful that I've learned to pray and, I, and, and that I, I feel like I hear his voice. I hear his spirit. I feel it. I, I know that we're far, far from where we want to be in this aquatic world of open water competition and excitement. And it's a thrilling, thrilling, thrilling event. And yet, if we're going to move forward, we have to do it with responsibility and it's going to be well beyond our generation. But if it's going to go on and I believe that it will, and I've made a prediction that a hundred years from now, the marathon event at the Olympics is going to be the biggest swimming event in the Olympic games. None of us will be here to see it maybe, but I don't know. My belief is that Fran left us with an undying spirit. I heard the word grit tonight relentless persistence. I, I think love is what it comes down to for me. So I want to thank you all for sharing the love, for being here and um, God bless you all. And uh, may we see each other at the next reunion. Thanks for being here. Good night. <laughs>